Up to this point, we've been talking about Australopithecus, the genus Australopithecus and its various species. Of course, humans are most interested in themselves, their own genus, their own species, Homo sapiens. So today we're going to start a discussion of the origins, the roots of our own genus Homo and the diversity of species that are included in that genus Homo. Again, I'm showing a picture of Olduvai Gorge because Olduvai was an important place in our thinking about what differentiates Homo, or the Latin for man, from Australopithecus, meaning, as I've said before, the, in South Africa they call them ape men. But what are the differences between Australopithecus and Homo? When did those differences arise? Why did they arise? And how did they arise? And what's the meaning of those differences? Well, on a historical note, it's fascinating to understand or to, to look at that we know lots about Australopithecus. I mean, it's amazing. We've got Afarensis, right, with 400 plus specimens from one single site. We've got a diversity of Australopithecus in South Africa and in East Africa. Uh, we know a lot about the geography, we know a lot about the distribution over time, we know a lot about the different species that we can comfortably fit within Australopithecus. And between 1924, which you'll remember is when Dart recognized the Tong child that was brought to him in this wooden box, and 1964 are 40 years of time. And our knowledge of Homo was pretty minimal. We knew a lot more about Australopithecus than the origins of our own genus, which is ironic. Now in 1964, there was a major discovery or announced, it was made in 1960 at Olduvai that we'll talk about, that was considered to be the earliest, most ancient Homo. It's called Homo habilis, just to give you a forecast. And up until that point, we had Homo neanderthalensis in Europe, a Neanderthal man. We had something called Homo heidelbergensis, but not a lot was really known about them and they weren't thought to have anything to do with us anyway. And uh, Homo erectus or Peking in Java man. But in 1964, a specimen about 1.8 million years old, a contemporary of Zinge or Olduvai hominid 5, Boisei, was found at Olduvai, and we'll talk quite a bit about that. Today, in paleoanthropology, to a very large extent, scholars are beginning to focus more intensely on understanding the roots and the diversity in our own genus at the very, very earliest stages. It is probable, we're thinking, that maybe Homo, like Australopithecus, like many mammalian groups, underwent and adaptive radiation. And finally, people are beginning to wonder if climate change had something to do with that. I think it probably did. How directly we can prove this, I don't know. But certainly around three million years when Afarensis disappeared, very soon thereafter there was a diversity of Australopithecus and we're beginning to see the same thing happening in the genus Homo. And maybe that cooling trend that brought about the opening of habitats, the opening of new ecological niches, the opening of new opportunities, and the, and, and the new stresses in, that were put on species that often promote change played a role indirectly, uh, it played a role because of the major climatic change that occurred. In the late Pliocene, say 3 million to 1.8 million years ago, uh, we saw lots of things happening. We see the emergence of pretty rudimentary stone tools, uh, as you see in the middle, or sort of choppers or uh, just little tools that fit into your hand. Uh, we see a diversity into Boisei, Robustus, Aethiopicus, and the beginnings down below of different kinds of Homo. In Australopithecus, we've talked about all of these uh, species. 
uh, some from South Africa, some from Eastern Africa. Just a little refresher for you. And in Homo, beginning about 2.4 million years ago, we begin to see the emergence of definitive species of uh, our own genus. And we'll talk about Heidelbergensis, Habilis, Ergaster, Rudolfensis, Erectus, and all of this, out of all of this, somehow we emerged today as Homo sapiens. Now, if we very broadly, we step back, and sort of have a broader overview of Australopithecus versus Homo. You have the classic 406 skull or cranium on the left, and on the right, you have a classic early Homo cranium. Well, in terms of teeth and jaws in Australopithecus, they were generally large, right? Large teeth, large jaws, powerful jaws. In humans, in Homo, much more reduced in terms of size, thickness, so on. S size of teeth reduced. Were they beginning now to process food outside of the mouth with stone tools? Okay. Brain size, relatively small in Australopithecus. Relatively large in Homo. Uh, the overall shape of the skull of Australopithecus, still that ape-like character to it. All right, low sloping forehead, and so on. Whereas in uh, moderns, um, we're looking at skulls that were more modern in aspect, that were rounder, for example. And in terms of the postcrania, you look at things like Australopithecus, they had very long arms, relatively short lower limbs. They were walking upright, but they didn't have bodies of modern proportion like us with relatively long lower limbs. And it's not a morphological feature, but we have to consider it because it is so uniquely part of our world is our tools. And in this case, we're only looking at stone tools. Did Australopithecus make and use stone tools? I will reveal to you some possibilities that that may have indeed been the case. But ultimately, we have become totally dependent on tools for our survival. So with Homo, comes an increasing dependence on tools for survival. In terms of the shape of teeth and jaws, if you look at on the left, classic Australopithecus afarensis um, upper jaw, palate, looking at the roof of the mouth, very ape-like, long parallel sided tooth rows, shallow palate, large teeth. And if you look at early Homo, the earliest Homo upper jaw we have at 2.4 million, it's got a much more rounded arch to it, a very deep palate, short from front to back, wide from side to side. Significant differences there. If we look at faces or skulls, there's a sagittal crest in some Australopithecus, no brow ridges, and a very strange shaped projecting face. Whereas in Homo, you have projecting nasal bones as opposed to a very flat nose, you have the beginnings of brow ridges, and you have a reduction of the anterior portion of the face. So there's a reduction in prognathism, or projecting face, in Homo. On the right, you see a very orthognathic, or vertical face, larger, much larger cranial capacity. And on the left, smaller cranial capacity, more sloping forehead, with a somewhat projecting face. Cranial capacity, or the capacity of the inside of the brain case. Remember, as I said, it's not all brains. Some people like to call it endocranial volume. But clearly, when you look back at Australopithecus, this group down here, right in here, Ethiopicus, Boisei, Africanus, uh, Afarensis, etc., you have cranial capacities generally below 550 cc's. In Homo, this group and a whole series of species that we'll talk about, there's a general increase in terms of our cranial capacities. Neanderthals, as you can see, are a little bit larger on average, but we'll address that a little bit later. But there is this trend towards an increase in cranial capacity over time. Now, looking at it another way, looking at cranial capacity uh, versus time. This is time 
down here. This is cranial capacity. So back among Australopithecines, uh, everything from Afarensis down here, uh, right on up through Africanus and so forth and so on. You, again, you see a, a, a trend from smaller to larger. And you see that trend going particularly like this, and near the end, a very rapid expansion in brain size. Something is happening at that point, and we will embrace that later. One can look at it another way. It's called the encephalization quotient, which is simply the size of the brain relative to the size of the body. And we have to consider that. We have a very large brain compared to our body. That gives you a encephalization quotient of 7.2, okay? Whereas when you look at chimpanzees, they have relatively small brains. Their encephalization quotient is in here. When you look at early Homo, like Homo habilis or Homo erectus, you see they're a little bit bigger. But we stand out as having excep exceptionally, especially large brains compared to our body size. And the other thing we need to consider when we look at this is, what's the relationship between brain size and tools? Does it take a lot more intelligence to make these tools? Or are there other factors like social complexity to play a role? When it comes to tools, no creature in the world has this endless creativity that we talked about, I think, in maybe lecture one or two. We talked about that we are limitless in terms of our creativity. Uh, yes, chimpanzees use perishable tools like twigs and blades of grass to fish for termites. As you see this chimp on the left, uh, in West Africa, they've been known since the time of Darwin, when Portuguese sailors first reported it, that they will use rocks to break up nuts. Okay, but these aren't manufacturing tools. Homo is always associated with stone tools. They may be very, very rudimentary. Olduin tools like these or more sophisticated tools like the Ashelaean or hand axes, or the upper Paleolithic where you're using not just stone, but bone and antler and ivory, or even the middle Paleolithic that we'll talk about where you're beginning to use body decoration and so on. So Olduin tools are simple percussion tools. It's just taking two rocks and banging them together, and banging flakes off. And you get these sharp edges that can be used for cutting like defleshing an animal, doesn't mean you're hunting it, you're probably scavenging it. And those kinds of activity leave telltale marks. This is a little piece of antelope, about two million years old. And um, it is a, a uh, just where the mandible articulates with the skull. This is the condyle, as it's called. It goes back and forth as the jaw opens and closes. And look at those marks right there by my thumb. Those are cut marks made by a stone, made by a human ancestor 1.8 million years as it was disarticulating the jaw from the cranium. The oldest good evidence for this is about 2.6 million years. Uh, and it consists of flakes and choppers, pebble tools. The tool shapes are not standardized, as you can see. And raw materials vary. They're often brought in from as far away as 20 kilometers. So they're purposefully making these tools. These are not the byproducts of just banging tools together, banging stones together, or opening up um, hard covered nuts, for example. There was a complete shift from any arboreal activity. Yes, we climb trees as kids, and some people climb to get fruits or coconuts or whatever. But we are ground-living terrestrial creatures, and that shows in our skeletons, and you see that in all of these individuals here. Body size and body proportion. Remember, Lucy was only three and a half feet tall, a meter tall. We are much taller, and we have very different shaped they're very different body proportions. In Australopithecus, in general, they have short thigh bones and that are about the same length as the upper arm bone, about 85% in the case of Lucy. Whereas we, our humerus, is only 70% is only the length of 
the thigh bone or femur. In chimps, the arm bone, the humerus, is 100% the length of the femur. So this, obviously, this long lever arm, which we call the lower limb, is extending in length to increase the efficiency of bipedalism. So there are major differences happening, not just in the cranial dental region, but also in the postcranial region. And in our next presentation, we will look into the evidence for the earliest homo.